1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 1. It says, And David fled from Naywith in Ramah, and came and said before Jonathan, What have I done? What is my iniquities? What is my sin before thy father, that he seeketh my life? Now David says, What have I done? What I'm, I'm walking with the Lord, living a Christian life, and look what's happening to me. This is what David is saying. He's, he's, he is. He's walking a, a Christian walk, walking with the Lord, and here Saul is trying to kill him. He's after him, telling lies about him. And just like the Lord allowed the devil to do things to Job, and Job did the same thing, you know, what, Job said the same thing. What have I done? Why is this coming on me? David is, doing, is responding the same way here. What have I done? We need to recognize that things can go wrong in our lives, but it's not because we're not walking with the Lord. Remember what it says in Matthew 5.45. It says, That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh the son, his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. The Lord's telling us right here, same thing that hap happens to the wicked people, lost people, it's still going to happen to us. Same thing. But we have Him to lean on. We have Him to carry us through these times. Amen. So, uh, when things are happening, just like David and Job, God allowed this to happen to them for a reason. That's why we, no matter what we go through, we got to see, okay, I'm walking with the Lord. I'm walking with the Lord. So whatever's happening to me, it's because God is allowing it to happen to me. Now, if you're not walking with the Lord, totally different picture. If you're not walking with the Lord and something happens, it's your fault. You're not walking with God. So you can't blame God if something happens to you while you're out there away from Him. But when you're walking with the Lord, just like these men, Job and David, then He says, hey, it rains on the just and the unjust. He never told us, hey, when you become mine, nothing's ever going to happen to you now. He never said that. In the next few verses, David is speaking to Jonathan. And he's telling him that he's going to go hide from Saul. And if we'll drop down to verse 6 on chapter 20, it says, if thy, father at, if thy father at all miss me, then say, David earnestly asked leave of me that he might run to Bethlehem his city, for there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. Now this is where David starts to go down. He's telling Jonathan to lie to his father. David is asking, is asking Jonathan to lie. And as we learned in the past, Jonathan and David are, are covenant brothers. They are covenant brothers. We've learned about blood covenant between man and man, man and woman, and us and God. There's a blood covenant. And David and Jonathan have one. So David is starting to ask Jonathan, his brother, to lie for him. Did he forget what the Lord did with him when he fought the giant? That God was there with him? Even though Saul's after David, he should still be feeling the same way. God is going to protect me. But David is starting to get in the flesh now because he's asking his brother and the Lord to lie for him. Now Christians don't do that. We don't do that. That's getting away from the Lord. So David, like I said, David's starting to take a little downhill. He thinks he's alone now for some reason. I mean, God was with him when he fought the giant. God was with him when, when Saul threw the javelin at him and missed him. But for some reason, David's taking a turn here. The Lord didn't tell him to flee from Saul. That was, a, that was on his own that he ran from Saul. Now when he was running from Saul... He also ran from the prophet that was there to protect him. So not only did he leave Saul, but he left a man of God that God was using to protect him. And like I said, now we're seeing that he's asking a covenant brother, a covenant brother, not just a brother in the Lord. We're talking about covenant. When you make a covenant, a blood covenant, that's just like Jesus shedding his blood for us. And now we have a blood covenant when, we, when you accept that. We have a blood covenant. That's just, just as, uh, as strong between a brother and a man and a woman. The blood covenant between a man and a woman. Which I've explained about that before. So David, he's gone from trusting in God to trusting in people. 
He's trusting in Jonathan to, to lie to his father. David has started to look with his physical eyes at what's going on. This man is after me. He's throwing a javelin at me. He missed me, but he's, he's throwing a ja javelin at me. He sent soldiers to come and kill him, which they weren't able to. So he's starting to look with these eyes, the physical eyes, instead of what he's been doing, keeping his eyes on the Lord. He's taking his eyes off the Lord and starting to look at things that are happening to him. You might ask, well, what should he have done? He should have sat there and continued to watch the Lord. To watch the Lord fight the battles for him. Because that's what the Lord does. The Lord fights our battles. It says in Psalms 46.10, it says, be, he's talking to us. He said, be still. God is telling us, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. But the Lord is telling us right here, be still. Why is he telling us to be still? He got it. Right. Because he has it. In Psalms 91, verses 1 through 5. It says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say unto the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome puzzling. He shall cover thee with His feathers and under His wings shall they, thou trust. His trust shall be thy shield and thy buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid. These are the words of God here. He's talking mm -hmm. to us right here. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night nor for the arrow that flies by day. The Lord tells us over and over through the scriptures, I am there. I am there. God, God Almighty. We need to comprehend who God is. We need to comprehend who He is. He is the one who made the heavens and the earth. He made this. Right. You know how big this earth is, huh? Not only did He make the earth, but He, did, he made the heavens. As far as they can go, as these scientists, I don't care how far they can look out there, God made it. All right, God made all this. So, and this is the same God that's saying, "Hey, I'm your shield." Amen. 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 When you're a Christian, when you're a born again Christian, and you're walking with the Lord, Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I really don't know what words to say, but the, He's got you. Yeah. You are protected. Also, in Second Chronicles chapter twenty, verse seventeen, you shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. Many times the Lord sent Israel out to, into battle. And when the Lord sent them, there were none killed. The Israelites, oh, it was always the enemy they got, they got killed. But when the Lord does something, He does it right. Yeah. All right, amen? amen. Ephesians 6, verses 13 through 14. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. The Lord, is, there are several scriptures right here I just gave you. He's telling us to stand. Right. Do we go out there and fight the devil? No. We don't go fight the devil. There's, there's Christians who do. They go out there and they're screaming and yelling at the devil. God didn't tell us to do that. He said to stand and let him do a fight. Because who are we fighting against? Not flesh and blood. The Ephesians says we fight against the spirit world. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're fighting against the spirit world. So if we're fighting against the spirit world, then we need the Lord. Because yeah. we can't fight against spirits. Right. God gave him a promise that he would be king. He told David he would be king. Now, when God tells you something like that, believe it. Right. It's going to happen. If he tells you something, whatever it is, he told David you're going to be king. David should have just, just like he had faith on the giant that he would defeat the giant. He should have faith. Hey, I'm going to be king. Why should I fear Saul killing me? Why should I fear that? I'm walking with the Lord. Why should I fear that? 
Because God said, I'm going to be king. But apparently, just like the rest of us, he's got a short memory. Christians have short memories. God does something spectacular over here, and then they get in over here to another little problem, and they forget how God saw them through this one. We have a bad memory. David started to get impatient, just like us. And what happens when we get impatient, waiting on the Lord? We get ahead of Him. We get ahead of the Lord when we get impatient. And I give you an example. Single, single men and women, God's got a person out there for you. Now, a lot of times, we can't wait. Now, I'm talking about single men and single women. We can't, y'all can't wait. And guess what? You start going on your feelings that this is the one. Instead of waiting on the Lord, you start going on your feelings. Feelings will get you in trouble. Hear from the Lord. The Lord will let you know. You'll know. Just like you know your name, you'll know that God is saying, this is the one for you. But a lot of young Christian singles, they make that mistake. They get ahead of God, and they get impatient, and then they start going on their feelings. Well, he's cute, or she's, you know, she's pretty, and blah, blah, blah. That's not the way the Lord does it. The Lord says, this is the one for you, and he will let you know. You won't have to go, I thank the Lord, no. You will know. Just like you know that you're born again. When you gave your life to the Lord, I know I'm born again. When I gave my life to the Lord, I know I'm born again. Because he told me I could know. In 1 John, he says, you can know. Well, I know. And just like other things, when the Lord speaks to me, I know when it's from the Lord. I just know it. It's just like people say that he speaks to you in that still, small voice. Nobody can explain it. But until you get it, then you, then you can understand what it is. But we can't get ahead of the Lord. And that's just, that's just not with uh, single people either. I'm just not talking about them. Remember I told you earlier that Christians don't run unless God tells you last week. Unless God tells you to flee, just like he told Joseph and Mary with baby Jesus. Yeah. He told them to flee. But if God doesn't tell you to run, don't run. Right. Don't run. You have no reason. David's starting to run here. And God didn't tell him to run. And then we're going to see the trouble he's going to get into. Because he's running now. He's not in the will of God. But we can't look too down at David though. Because in our today life, do we run away from, from, our, from some of our problems? Do we do the same thing? We have problems come into our life and we run from them. Instead of attacking them with, with, with the Lord, we run from them. And let's, like I said, unless God tells you to run, don't run from them. There's no problem out there too big where God can't handle. You, we got to remember who is on our side. Right. We got to remember who is in us. Not only is he, he God, he's God of the universe, but he's a God that's living in you. God is living in us. Amen. Ooh, if we can ever comprehend that Almighty God is in us, <laughs> we can be some happy people. <laughs> And David trusted God, then he didn't trust God. You know, sounds like us. You know, they, I'm, I'm reading about David, I'm like, man, why are you doing that? But I got to think, wait a minute. Yeah. You know, I've done that. I've, I've trusted in him. And then something over here, minor, after looking at it, after the Lord takes care of it, we look at it, and we're like, that wasn't nothing. Why was I scared of it? You know? <laughs> At the, at the end of this chapter, it says that Jonathan and David went their way and blessed each other. And it, say, and it said David deported. So let's see where he went when he deported. 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses, verse 1. Then came David to Nob to Amalek the priest. And Amalek was afraid at the beating of David and said unto him, Why art thou alone and no man with thee? Now the priest was probably afraid because he knew David and he knew King Saul, which is still king at the time because he's a king. And back then, kings, they're not like presidents. Presidents got to go through this and do, go through that to do what they want to do. Back then, if a king said, kill him, he was dead. What the king said went and nobody argued with him. So this priest was, he knew David was running from the king. And that's why he was afraid when he, when, the, when he saw David come. 
His reaction was uh, like 1 Samuel 16.4. It says, And Samuel, the prophet Samuel, and Samuel did that which the Lord spoke and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Comest thou peacefully? So that's the way Amalek reacted. Because he, he didn't know if they was coming in peace or if he was bringing the trouble with them. Now, there's two scenarios. It really doesn't say... I'm using this as one, and then there's another one I'm going to use. It really doesn't say, but I'm thinking it's one of these two. And there's not too many times I tell you I'm thinking. That's one thing. I don't hardly ever say I think. Because I don't care what people think, and I'm sure you don't care what I think. But it's all about he was afraid. And it really doesn't really doesn't say why he was afraid. But I'm choosing. It was either that or he recognized David as being king. He's not king He's a he's no, he's anointed to be king. He's not king yet, but he was a. It's like your boss at work, or boss of a company, a big boss that's over here, and your company's over here. And people say, "Hey, the big boss is coming." You're like, "Ooh, why is he coming over here?" You know, you know. You, you understand what I'm trying to yeah. give an example here? Why is the big big boss coming? You know, and this this priest here might that's maybe that's how he reacted. You know. David is going to be king. He, everybody knows that. So he's like, why is this king coming over here? You know? Those are just two scenarios I, I use because it really doesn't say, but maybe it was one of them. Maybe it was neither one of them. I don't know. But there's not too many times I do this. So this is not my Bible study where I say I'm not sure. So in chapter 22, verse 9 and 10, it says, Then answered, Then Doeg, the em- Amnamite, which was set over the servants of Saul, and said, I saw the son of Jesse come to Nob, to Amalek, the son of Ahadab, and he required of the Lord for him, and gave him medals, and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. Now some of this, y'all might not know where I'm at, because this is what I taught last week, these scriptures here, but that's, that's what happened when David went over there. And we can see that these verses that David wanted the priest to consult the Lord for him. David, David, like I say, he started to go down. He started to lie and he's not looking for the Lord to protect him. But now he's coming back on track and he's seeking this priest to, to, talk, to speak to the Lord for him. To find out what does the Lord want him to do. Because it says, and he acquired of the Lord for him. So this, this priest inquired to the Lord for David. And then verse 2, And David said unto Elimelech the priest, The king hath commanded me a business, and hath said unto me, Let no man know anything of the business whereabout I sent thee, and what I have commanded thee. And I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. This king is seeking the Lord for David. And this is what David wants. But then David turns right around, and, he, and now he's telling a lie. First he had Jonathan lie for him. Now David's telling a lie because he said the king sent him. Saul didn't send him there. He's running from Saul. But right here saying, the king sent me. Well, we know that's not true. Saul did not send him. We're going to see what we're going to see what sin can bring, even when you just have a little lie. David, who fought the giant, is now scared to tell the truth. Now, as I'm talking about David, we need to check, check ourselves out. You know, do I do stuff like this? Am I like David? One second I'm, I'm here with the Lord and the next second I'm, I'm lying. You know, we need to check ourselves out. When we wake up in the morning, the Lord says in Psalms, meditate on me day and night. He said, meditate on him day and night. We should always be checking ourselves, making sure that we're walking with the Lord. That's what we need to do. Make sure we're walking with the Lord. Because you just go along with, with the day and the next thing you know, uh, oh, how did I get here? You find that you're not walking with the Lord. So there's a reason why God said, meditate on me day and night. There's a reason for that. It reminds me of Peter. Peter, who had strong faith, in the Lord, walked on the water, walked on the water. Yeah. When they arrested Jesus, and this little girl, a little girl at the campfire, 
said, that's one of them. Talk about the, he's one of the disciples. And he says, I don't know. He lied to the little girl. I mean, he goes just like David. He goes from walking on the water to being scared to tell the truth to a little girl. Hmm? This is what this is what happens when you're not walking continually with the with the Lord. But we fall down, but we get right back up. Because if you stay down, then guess who's getting the victory? Satan. Satan's getting the victory. Because he wants us to fall, and we're gonna fall. Because we're still in these fleshly bodies. We're going to fall. But we need to get right back up. Get back with the Lord. And start walking with Him again. But David was scared. Peter was scared. Why? Why? After they did these marvelous... After God was with them and did these things. So if these two men of God... Peter was a man of God. David is a man of God. So I'm thinking, shoot... I better stay close to the Lord because if they can fall like that, right. I, definitely I can fall. So that's why I stated, I read the Bible like the Lord says. I'm hungry for it and I read it. And this is why I have a Bible study because I love to study the Word of God. And this is where He's led me to. But we need to all be this way, not just me. We all need to be hungry for the Word of God so we don't have falls like this. Like I said, we're going to fall but we can, the Lord puts these in here for us to learn from them. He puts these in, he don't just show all, just the good part of David. He, he beat the giant and all this. He's going to be king. He don't just show the good part of David. He shows the bad part of David also. Right. To show us, hey, we better keep our eyes on the Lord. Because we can easily fall also. Right. Christians deny Christ all the time. Christians do. We do it in different kind of ways, but we do deny Christ in our life. And that makes us what? That, that makes us a liar. Because we act like there's times, there's times. It might be, uh, okay, if you're a guy and you're around a bunch of guys, you know, you're kind of like, you want to be accepted, so you're not going to talk about the Lord. Well, the Lord, what did the Lord put us here for? To witness. To witness about Him. So there's many ways we deny the Lord. But... Get this now. We are children of God. We're not liars. We're children of God. You're born again Christian. You're a child of God. You're a child of God. Now, you might be a child of God who may lie every now and then. Because we have weaknesses and we find ourselves lying because whatever the situation might be. But that doesn't mean we're liars. That's not our way of living. We have weak, we have weak points, and they're different for different people. But like I said, not there's not a Christian out there that doesn't lie or whatever in some kind of way, because we're not perfect. But also at the same time, we don't use that as an excuse not to lie. I mean, to lie. Well, I'm not perfect, you know. No, no. The Lord knows our hearts. He knows our hearts. He knows when we're doing it, and it doesn't bother us. We're just doing it to, on purpose. But then he knows when we're doing it because we have a weak moment. He knows. He knows, our, he knows our heart better than we do. Like I said, this is not to justify sin. In fact, we, we should hate sin. In fact, Romans 7.15, it says, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do, do I. So, you know, I hear in Romans saying, What you want to do, you want to do good, but then you don't. Okay? You want to, but you don't. But then it says, that what I'm doing, that I'm not supposed to be doing, is what I, is what I hate. It's what it says right here in Romans. Also in Psalms 97.10, it says, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. So God tells us, we, we need to hate sin. Right. We need, in fact, we're not taught on the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who mourn. I, show, I showed you, mourning doesn't mean when someone dies. The Lord was saying, we should mourn when we sin. Because we hate sin. And we should mourn. Why should we mourn? Because we're sinning against God. Right. The Bible says, you're, you're sinning against me. That's what the Lord says. So that's why we should mourn. When we sin, we sh it should bring us down. Because we just, we just displeased our Lord. Right. 
Do we overlook sin that's around us? Or does it bother us? I've taught on this before. Yeah. Do we laugh at sin? No. We shouldn't. But I'm watching uh, Two and a Half Men. That's not a show I should be watching. But I'm watching it and I'm laughing. I'm wrong. I'm, I'm wrong. I shouldn't be watching movies like that just, that just promote a, uh, adultery, fornication. That's all that show does. But here I am laughing at, at what they're doing. This is wrong. This is wrong. And I know this and I need to correct myself on that. I shouldn't be watching comedy that's, that's against God. Right. All right. And we, are, we, are, we should all be that way. It says hate sin. So if this show is something on, it's just promoting sin, then we should hate it. That's what the Lord says. These TVs, just like anything else, TV can be a blessing, but it also can be a sin, what we watch. Just like money. Anything can be good, but we can make it bad. Verse 3. Now therefore, what is under thy hand? This is David talking to that priest. Give me five loaves of bread in my hand, or what there is present. And the priest answered David and said, there is no common bread under my hand, but there is hollow bread. If the young men have kept themselves at least from women, and David answered the priest and said unto him, O oh, of a truth, women have been kept from us about th these three days since I came out, and the vessels of the young men are holy, and the, and the bread is in a manner common, yea, though it were sanctified, sanctified this day in the vessel. Now what this priest is saying, I have holy bread. Not that the bread was holy. There's nothing, there's, there's no holy water, there's no holy bread, there's no holy food. These, these verses are talking of bread that was prepared for like a sacrifice or something like that. Okay? It wasn't that the bread was holy, it, just, it was prepared for a holy event. To have. Just like the Lord's Supper, the bread and the wine, that was not holy. It was bread and it was wine, but it was to re represent what was going on. It was a symbol of what was going on. Hope you understand what I'm trying to say here. Yeah. The priest told him that they could have this bread if they haven't been with women recently. This is what the priest told David. And what he's referring to is what it says in Leviticus 15 verses 17 through 18. Any clothing or leather with semen on it must be washed in water, and it will remain unclean until evening. After a man and a woman have sexual intercourse, they must each bathe in water, and they will remain unclean until the next evening. David tells the priest, yes, they are holy, meaning they're clean. Okay, now we're talking to, to, about his men. He said, you know, have your men been with women? And the word women is referring to wives. We'll see that in 2 Samuel 11, 11. It said, you know, where uh, Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba. You know who Bathsheba is, right? Mm -hmm. That's the one David, okay? Where Uriah, her husband, <clears throat> refused to sleep with her while he was on military duty. Now this is what, that's why the priest said, have your men been with women? Talking about wives, not just women. Because if he was saying just women, then they wouldn't be clean anyway. Because they, then they'd be sinning. Okay? No, it's talking about wives here. And he wanted to know if they'd been with their wives. Because it's saying right here that the semen makes you unclean. And even though you washed that day after, after you had intercourse, you're still unclean until the next evening. So that's why, that's why I'm pointing this out. He wanted to know if his men were clean. Verse 6. So the priest gave him hollow bread, for there was no bread there but the show bread that was taken from before the Lord to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. And why didn't they have regular bread and only hollow bread? It tells us in Leviticus 24, verses 5 through 8, it says, And thou shalt take fine flour and bake twelve cakes thereof, two tenth deals shall be in one cake, Thou shalt set them in two rows, six on a row, upon the pure table before the Lord, and thou shalt put pure frankincense upon each row, that it may be on the bread for the memorial, even an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Every Sabbath 
Now, back then, every Sabbath, it was Saturday. This is not talking about Sunday. Every Saturday, he shall set in order before the Lord continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. And it shall be Aaron's and his sons, and they shall eat in the holy place, for it is the most holy unto him of the offering of the Lord, made by fire, by a perpetual statue. So every Saturday that it would replace the old bread with fresh bread. So the old bread was able, then the old bread, was, the priests were able to eat that. So this was on a Saturday because it was fresh bread. It was hollow bread. Hope I didn't lose you there. Mm. But because that's all they had. Now, the religious people in Jesus' time, they would have barked at this very easily. They were always finding, trying to find mistakes or something Jesus was doing to, to say, hey, you're not supposed to do that. Yeah. Which, that's another teaching, but the, the Levites and all them, they, I mean, not the Levites, the Pharisees and them, they would have they had a field day with this, knowing that this priest gave these men hollow bread. Remember, it's not holy bread. It's just what it represents. Now, verse 7. Now, a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord, and his name was Doe, Enomite, the chiefest of the herdmen that belonged to Saul. And David said unto Elimelech, And is there not here under thy hand spear or sword? For I have neither brought my sword nor my weapon with me, because the king's business required haste. And the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Elad, Behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind Ephron. If thou wilt take that, take it, for there is no other except that one here. And David said, There is none like that. Give it to me. And David is now wanting a sword. If this sword, if this is Goliath's sword, did that sword help Goliath? No. So why does David want it? If it didn't help Goliath, why, why does David think this sword is going to help him? David's not walking with the Lord. Remember that. He's not walking with the Lord. He's thinking he's needing this weapon to go against Saul and his men. Has he had to fight against Saul and his men yet? No. He hasn't. But like I said, David is back in the flesh thinking here instead of thinking, you know, spiritually. Okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? Remember, we are bad. We are bad. We are bad. Our memory is bad. I say we, because just like David here, I know we've done it in our own life. I mean, if y'all haven't, amen, you're stronger than I am. You're better at Christian than I am. In verse 10, And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul and went to Asius, the king of Gath. Now, listen to this. This is David. Remember, he's not walking with the Lord. He's gotten a sword and he's went to Gath. Guess what? Gath is where Goliath is from. <laughs> when you're not walking for, with the Lord, you can't think so. you, you're doing things. That is, I mean, he's got Goliath's sword, and then he goes to his own city where he's from. We have no common sense when we're not walking with the Lord. Let me say that. He's running from one enemy into another one. He's running from Saul, his enemy, but he's going right into another enemy. See what happens when we're not walking with the Lord? We do foolish things. He's coming into town with a sword of Goliath, which he probably couldn't even carry. Because yeah. Goliath, he was, like I say, he was about 11 foot tall, and it said how, how heavy his sword was. And David, he's still a small guy. So he's probably dragging it. He's not probably not carrying it. He's probably dragging the sword. <laughs> he has killed thousands, among thousands of Philistines, and he's going there thinking, surely Saul won't follow me here. Yeah, he's probably right. Saul probably won't follow him there. But where's he going? Yeah, where, why are you even going there? <laughs> like I say, he's running from this enemy right into the hands of the other enemy. Hey, I'm po we're pointing all this out. Well, not me, but the Lord. He's showing us. He's telling us the story about David because we need to learn from it. When you're not walking with the Lord... You just go from one trouble to another one. That's all you do. That's all we do. Verse 11. 
And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing one to another to him in, in dances, saying, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands? Now even the enemy, they know what's going on. They said, King, is not this David the king? He's not king yet. King Saul is still king. But they are, everybody knows that David is going to be king. Yeah. I mean, even the enemy knows that. Who's our enemy? The devil. I'm talking about our enemy. Who's our, our enemy is the devil, right? right? And he knows, the devil knows, when we give our heart to the Lord, he knows we've made it. We are justified. We've been made right with God. He has already judged us. The day of judgment is for the for lost people. Okay? Or we have already been judged by God. And we've been justified. We have been judged to be right. And, our, and the devil knows that. Does that mean he's going to leave us alone? Hmm. Doesn't mean that. Verse 12. And David laid up these words in his heart and was sore afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. When he heard them speaking about the songs they were doing, about Saul had his thousands and David had his ten thousands, how many they killed, then David, David started to get afraid. Because right there in, in the town of Goliath, his city, where he's from, they're saying, they used to sing about him killing ten thousand of us, the Philistines. And David starting to hear this, he's going, he's, he's saying, well, maybe I made a mistake here. Did he make a mistake? When you're not walking with the Lord, we make mistakes. Verse 13, And he changed his behavior before them and, and framed himself mad in their hands and, scra and scrabbled on the doors of the gate and let his spittle fall down upon his beard. It says that ch David changed his behavior. Alright, he changed it. But he changed it in the wrong way. <laughs> now David, this is what David could have done. This is what David could have done if he's walking with the Lord. He could have gone in there and said, Hey, I am going to be king. I have been anointed to be king. I suggest you all lay your swords down. Just, just David by himself. But he could have done that. Because who was right there with him? They couldn't see him, but who was right there with him? The Lord. The Lord was, would have been with him. David could have done this. They know he killed Goliath, so... <laughs> they, David could have this is what he should have done if you're walking with the Lord you do things totally different from the way you do things in the flesh but he didn't do that what did he do? he acted like he was a madman because of not depending on the Lord he went from having no fear of the Philistines now to fearing them and pretending that he was a madman which he, he just continued to lie again. He just, he's not a madman, but he's, he's still lying. No, I'm a madman. They didn't want to, he, did, he was hoping that would get him out of it. It's like when you tell a lie for this thing over here. He started over here, right? Now he had to lie about this. Now he had to lie. Once you start lying, it just, it just keeps rolling. Yeah. Amen. We need to learn. I mean, we should know that by now, but we need to learn that. Yeah. <clears throat> He would scratch on the doors. He let saliva run down his beard. I mean, he was, he was going all the way. He was acting mad. And he, he went from being a mighty warrior. No, David. He went from being a mighty warrior. Soon to be king. Soon to be king. To acting like someone who was crazy. We need to recognize this. We need to recognize this. We need to... I, I'm, I'm, I'm like a broken record, but it's very important. You need to keep your eyes on the Lord. We need to keep our eyes on the Lord. Because if we don't, we'll do idiotic stuff like this. We will. We'll be making big mistakes and trying to get out of them and having to lie. And it just goes on and on and on. And guess what? That's what the devil wants. A little leaven leavens the whole lot. A little sin goes a long way. We're seeing that right here with David. Like I say, he went from a mighty warrior, a hero, soon to be king, to acting like a crazy man. Huh? Think about it. Verse 14. Then said Achish unto his servants, Lo, ye see the man is mad. 
Wherefore then have you brought him to me? Achish tells his men, Why are you bring this madman to me? That's what he's saying. And in verse 15, Have I need of a madman that ye have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? Achish, Achish is making it very clear. Hey, don't bring him over here. Right. That's, what, that's what he's saying right here. But now he's not looking to God, but doing what it says in Proverbs 3.5. He's doing what it says not to do in Proverbs 3.5. It says, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. That, yes, we do. But the second part, it says, And lean not unto thy own understanding. Trust in the Lord and don't lean on your own understanding. That's what David's right here doing. He's, seeing, he's looking with these eyes and he's doing what he thinks is right. That, that he has to, the way he can get out of this trouble is by acting like a madman. But if he would have been leading on the Lord, it would have been totally different. But David is not alone. We have Abraham and Isaac who told their wives a lie. Abraham and Isaac, I don't know if y'all know, but they both went into another nation and they told her because they have beautiful wives Abraham and Isaac did this not at the same time at different times but they told them they told the wife tell them you're my sister because if I tell if you tell them you're my wife they'll kill me right the Abraham man of God yeah yes Isaac man of God yeah they both lied they both lied did they have to no. they looked at going into an, another city Afraid that they might get killed so the, so the man can take the wife. Did they trust in the Lord? Or did they lean on their own understanding? God says right here, we've got to remember Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Did he say with your mind? He didn't say trust in the Lord with your mind. He said trust in the Lord with your heart. That is much stronger than the mind. He says don't lean on your own understanding. All three of these men were great men of God and look what they did. Like I said, this doesn't give us a reason to be weak because not God knows the heart. The Lord has just shown that when we fall, don't give the devil the victory and stay down. All three of these men are getting back up. We'll see that David's going to get back up. But the men of God get right back up. David failed the Lord tremendously. But we can't say anything because what what we uh, we we have also in First Samuel chapter twenty two verses one through four, David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Dulam, and when his brother and then all his father house heard it, they went down thither to him, and everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him. And he became a captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. Remember, David already had men following him. Because back in chapter 21, verse 3, he asked the priest for five loaves. Okay, a loaf would feed a man. So he already had men with him. Okay, now he's got this family and others coming. Now, his, his family and all those who were unhappy with their king, with King Saul. Remember, the Lord told Israel. Because Israel, remember last week, it said Israel wanted the king because all the other nations had the king. Israel had God. That was their king. But then they started complaining and say, we want a king. All these other nations have king. We want a king. And God told Samuel, okay, the prophet, he said, tell them this is what kind of king you're going to get. And Israel was like, I don't care. We don't care. We want a king. Yeah. So they got it. And now these, not only his family, but others are running away from this king. They asked for him, but now they're running from him. Now they don't want him. When you're, let me say this. When you're asking something from the Lord, it's okay. Ask in his will. But if you're like Israel, hey, no, this is the way, this is what I want, or this is what I want to do, whatever it is. And you're like, no, this is what I want. And you're talking, you're praying to the Lord and saying, no, nah, this is what I want. He might give it to you. Just like he did here. Israel wanted, wanted, wanted a king. So God said, okay, that's what you want. I'm going to tell you what you're getting. And he did. 
But they still wanted it. Watch what you ask for. Watch what we ask for. Now the Lord has shown that David is starting to get a small army here. 400 men. Verse 3, And David went this to Mizhed of Moab, and he said unto the king of Moab, Let my father and my mother pray thee, I pray thee, come forth and be with you till I know what God's will to do for me. Like I said, David does this. He's bad, then he goes back to the Lord. David starts to get back with the Lord, and one of the first things he does, what's he do? He gets, he gets protection for his parents. He's asking this king, hey, take care of my parents while, I'm, while I go seek God's will. He's, he's following the fifth commandment. The fifth commandment in the Bible, honor thy father and thy mother. That's what it says. That's what David was doing. He was taking care of them. You know, that commandment, if you live by that commandment, honor thy father and thy mother. Now, this is from the Lord. Okay, this is what God said. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord's telling us right here, if we honor our mother and our father, we're going to live a long life. That's what he's saying. We believe God's word. Yeah. All of it. What God is, this is what he's saying. Honor your father and your mother, and you'll live a long life. Amen? Amen. Now he went there because his grandmother, his great-grandmother, was Ruth. Remember I taught on the book of Ruth? Well, Ruth was his great-grandmother. That's why he went. Remember? She was a Moabitess, remember? Yeah. Okay. That's why he took his parents over there. Because his great-grandmother was from there. And he asked his king to take care of him. Now, later in 2 Samuel 8, 2, we'll see that David defeats them in battle. Now, this is... I'm not going to go into that, but later on, he, he had them take care of his parents... But in 2 Samuel 8 2, Dave defeats them. <laughs> I mean, this is the Word of God, okay? <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that in there. Verse 4 And he brought them before the king of Moab, and they dwelt with him all while that David was in the hole. He brought his parents to the king to protect them while he was waiting to hear from the Lord. And the word hole here means stronghold, it means it's like a fortress. It's not a fortress like a castle or anything. It's like, it's a hard place to get to. Maybe because of the woods or, or swamps or whatever, whatever it is. But that's a, a stronghold where, where, where David went to so they couldn't find him. So that's what he's talking about, the hole here. It, meant strong, it means stronghold. Now, in verses 5 through 23, I'm not going to go through those verses, but I'm going to tell you what they mean. Saul is angry with his officials and his men. And Doeg tells Elimelech, saying... He prayed to the Lord for David. Remember he was there when David went there and asked for the five loaves and everything. Well, Doe was there and he heard everything that was going on. Saul commands his men, his men, his soldiers, he commands them to, to kill all the priests. But they refuse. His soldiers, his men refuse to kill him because they're men of God. So Saul gets Doeg to massacre 85 priests. He says, I'll do it. And he kills, now listen, Doeg kills 85 priests. Not only them, but he kills their family, the children, the babies, and the animals. He kills everything. Now this is, this is King Saul. Saul was anointed by God. So believe it or not, Saul is a Christian man but he's not walking with the Lord. Look what a Christian man, how hateful and wicked a Christian man can get when he's not walking with the Lord. Right. He was anointed. God doesn't anoint uh, lost people. God anointed Saul. God did. And he has this man, Doeg, kill this family, their entire family, including babies. And the only priest to escape was the son of Elimelech. He went to David for protection and he performed the priestly duties for David the rest of his life. This priest did. This Christian who was fallen, now look what can happen. He's not walking with the Lord. When you're not walking with the Lord, you're in the flesh. And when you're in the flesh, you're wicked. 
we're wicked. You might tell yourself, I'm not capable of doing that. This is not what the Lord said in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. When, you're, when you don't have the Lord, you're evil continually. It's right here in the scriptures. He says, the, imagine of the, thir- the imaginations of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. It's only by God's grace and love that he is able to change us. Because we're capable of being this way. Don't think you're not. God said you're evil continually without him. So don't think, oh, I wouldn't do nothing like this. No. You need to get born again. God can change you. 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. New creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Now, now you have the Lord in you. And as long as you're, like I said, walking with Him, now you're you're not going to do these things because you have the love of God in you. You're not going to want to do stuff like this. But when you don't have Him, we are very, very capable of being that bad. I hope y'all hear me there. Because yeah. if there's anybody in here that thinks, oh, I, I wouldn't do that. No. Our heart is evil continually. God said it. Right. And the only way we can change it is by giving them our heart. Until you give God your heart, yes, we are very capable of doing things like this.